information on author tours around the country. You can also find a listing of jobs available at HarperCollins. The address on the internet is www.harpercollins.com slash. About Books airs every Saturday and Sunday on C-SPAN 2. Saturdays beginning at 8 p.m. Eastern and Pacific Time, Sunday nights at 9 Eastern and Pacific. This Sunday, retiring Senator William Cohen of Maine talks about how he fits writing into his busy life and reads some of his poetry. You'll also meet journalist and author Gene Lyons, whose new book is titled Fools for Scandal, How the Media Invented Whitewater. Next Saturday, part two of Goucher College's conference on creative nonfiction. Editors at several New York publishing houses give advice to authors on getting published. Also, Robert Mary talks about his biography of journalists Joseph and Stuart Alsop. The book is called Taking on the World. And former FBI agent James Hosty reads from his book Assignment Oswald to an audience in Florida. He was assigned to investigate Lee Harvey Oswald following President Kennedy's assassination. Next Sunday, Roy Beck and his new book, The Case Against Immigration. And Evan Morris shows how to find information about books on the World Wide Web. He's author of The Book Lover's Guide to the Internet. About Books, on C-SPAN 2, Saturdays at 8 Eastern and Pacific Time, and Sundays at 9. Author William Lutz discusses his new book, The New Doublespeak, Why No One Knows What Anyone's Saying Anymore. William Lutz is a professor of English at Rutgers University in New Jersey. His previous books include The Cambridge Thesaurus of American English. He spoke at Borders Books and Music in Chicago. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm the author. <laughs> Bill Lutz, uh, as if, you know, you need to know that. Th this is a little odd, because I'm a nonfiction writer. It, it, normally, readings are for fiction writers. My wife is, is a novelist, so because fiction has plot character and all that good stuff, and, and fiction writers get to read great excerpts from their novels, um, bring characters to life, give a sort of dramatic reading. And when you're a nonfiction writer, you don't have any of that stuff. Uh, and often, you don't really do a reading, but uh, the two things about my book, the first is a good friend of mine gave it what I thought was the highest compliment you can give this kind of a book. He said it's the perfect bathroom book. And, and, and secondly, that would, it, 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 that's a nice way of saying it's very episodic because it does have bits and pieces in there. But uh, for that reason, I do have a couple brief things that I could read that, that have oh, a story feel. That is, I wrote them as kind of stories, give a little bit of drama. And so I'll read just briefly uh, two sections and see what you think. This one is a section on uh, fresh chickens. When is a chicken a fresh chicken? As opposed to when is a chicken a frozen chicken? Give you some idea of what you can do with words. The power to label can bring large financial rewards as the continuing battle over fresh versus frozen chickens demonstrates. Now, to mere mortals such as us, there really isn't a problem here. We know when a chicken is frozen. It's one of those laws of physics that the freezing point for a chicken is 26 degrees Fahrenheit. We're not talking rocket science here. When I look in my freezer, I can spot a frozen chicken right away. But then, I don't work for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, where the laws of physics can be changed by government decree, or regulation, or doublespeak. When is a frozen chicken a fresh chicken? When it's a deep, chilled chicken. For quite a few years, the U.S. Department of Agriculture has allowed poultry producers to label as fresh chickens that have been frozen hard enough to make pretty good bowling balls, frozen all the way down to zero degrees Fahrenheit. Frank Perdue, let me pause for a second. Do we all know who Frank Perdue is? Is Frank in the area? Okay. See, when Frank first started out, he was only on the East Coast, and I would travel, you know, far from the environs of the East Coast, you know, like Detroit, and uh, people would say, who's Frank Perdue? So I, I also like to point out that there are two things that I like about Frank Perdue, or that I think are significant. The first is that uh, Frank Perdue will go down in the Advertising Hall of Fame because he invented the brand name chicken. Before Frank Perdue, a chicken was a chicken was a chicken. I mean, you went into the meat aisle and there were a lot of dead chickens there and you bought one. Now they all have brand names on them. 
And second, I always thought that it was interesting that Frank Perdue um, sold a product that looked pretty much like him. <laughs> so, Frank Perdue, the poultry tycoon, even ran television commercials in which he used a competitor's fresh chicken to hammer a nail into a board. But such chickens are not frozen, says the USDA. They are merely deep chilled. And that included chickens that were frozen solid, then thawed, and sold as fresh. Since there is little or no market for poultry that cannot be labeled or marketed as fresh, according to the National Broiler Council, the Chicken Dealers Trade Association, the pressure is on to keep the label fresh on frozen chickens. After all, fresh chickens sell for as much as $2 a pound more than label, uh, chickens labeled frozen. That works out to about $1 billion a year moving from consumers' pockets to the pockets of those who sell frozen chickens under a government-approved fresh label. When the state of California decided that a frozen chicken is a frozen chicken, and it didn't care what the USDA and the poultry dealers said, the National Broiler Council sued in federal court and won because federal rules preempt state laws. We affirm this absurdity, wrote the court. Congress has given federal bureaucrats the power to order that frozen chickens be labeled fresh. But the fight against frozen fresh chickens continued until in response to complaints that calling fresh a chicken that had once been a solid block of ice was just a little misleading, the folks at agriculture decided to recommend a change in labels. They proposed that any chicken that has seen the low side of 26 degrees Fahrenheit should be labeled hard chilled. The poultry folks were not happy and mounted a big effort to get the USDA to change this radical labeling effort. While the poultry folks didn't win, they did get the USDA to change the proposed hard chilled label to previously frozen. But even this change was too much for the poultry people. So they went directly to the source of all linguistic wisdom, the United States Congress. Led by Virginia Senator John Warner, 19 senators from the poultry producing states in the Southeast got Congress to decide on no change in the labeling of frozen chickens. So Congress in its wisdom rejected the proposed change and let stand the current regulation. So you can still drive nails or go bowling with an official fresh chicken. So the next time you go chicken shopping, think about that one. Uh, one of the things that I do in the book is besides hit the obvious targets, um, the great one-liners, uh, so to speak, is to look at the subtler forms of doublespeak that have a real impact upon our lives. And here's one from the state of Pennsylvania, um, which sort of got the attention of the folks in Pennsylvania. In the semantic environment of law, no can mean yes. At least, that was the case in Pennsylvania not too long ago. After a woman brought rape charges against a man for forcing her to engage in sex with him, the charges were dropped when the prosecutor said the woman had protested only with words. The woman had said no and don't do that repeatedly. But she had not physically tried to protect herself. Under a ruling by the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, Saying no is not enough to sustain a rape charge. So, in the state of Pennsylvania, no means yes in the language of sex. There is some evidence that this principle holds true in another activity in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania Supreme Court Justice Nicholas Papadakos said he was offended that the word bribery was used to describe the cash gifts members of the Philadelphia Roofers Union delivered to various Philadelphia judges during the Christmas season. These gifts consisted of envelopes containing three to five hundred dollars in cash. Justice Papadakos insisted that the term gratuities be used instead. For those for whom five hundred dollars in cash is a gift, no can very easily mean yes. I'm sure that's what the judges said as the envelopes were handed to them. No, 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 don't give that to me. And here's one that, uh, let's move it up to the United States Supreme Court for those of you who are na naive to believe in the power of voting. 
I, I'm sure that we all believe in the right to vote. Well, <clears throat> let me clarify this right according to the United States Supreme Court. You enter the voting booth all ready to exercise your rights as a citizen and cast your ballot for the candidate of your choice. Is there any activity more fundamental, more important to democracy? The Supreme Court has written that citizens have a constitutional right to vote and have their votes counted. Indeed, the court has emphasized that no right is more precious in a free country than that of having a voice in the election of those who make the laws under which, as good citizens, we must live. Other rights, even the most basic, are illusory if the right to vote is undermined. Boy, that sounds pretty good stuff, doesn't it? <clears throat> well, let's go on to chapter two here. Secure in this knowledge, you look at the ballot only to discover that there is just one candidate for office. And you happen to think that this candidate is a crook for whom you wouldn't vote even if he were the only candidate, which, by the way, he happens to be. So you exercise your right to vote by writing in the name of your choice. You know he won't win, but better a write-in vote for him than not voting at all. You lose. In Burdick v. Takushi, the Supreme Court ruled that despite the sacredness of the ballot, despite the basic and important nature of voting, your vote doesn't count because it's a write-in vote. And write-in votes don't count if the city, state, county, or whomever has a law banning write-in votes. According to the Supreme Court, you do not have, quote, a fundamental right to vote for any particular candidate. Close quotes. You are simply guaranteed an equal voice in the election of those who govern. That certainly sounds like the way they used to run elections in Russia before the fall of communism. You could vote for anyone you want as long as uh, it was one of the party candidates. So now, in Hawaii, Louisiana, Nevada, Oklahoma, South Dakota, Kentucky, and Virginia, your right to vote does not include the right to write in the name of the candidate you support. But you are free to vote for any of the party hacks, crooks, or other incompetents who happen to be on the ballot. This is the right to vote, as defined by the doublespeak of the U.S. Supreme Court. That's the kind of stuff that I like to expose, uh, that this is language that can really mess up your life. Um, in uh, the, the, the chapter on business, I begin it with a section that says, um, how do I fire thee, let me count the ways. Um, and I list 52 different terms for firing employees. And then I had to stop. I actually had a lot more because uh, the list was in danger of taking over the whole, whole book and I, I, I really couldn't do any more. Um, but I, I point out that what has moved from just the simple term of downsizing, we now have moved into a kind of categories of job uh, terms. That is, um, it's not that, that the, uh, we're just firing you and we're going to use a different word. Now we've gotten really sophisticated, you see. Um, one of the things that we'll do is not fire you, but you see, we'll eliminate your job, not you. But since your job isn't there, there's no reason for you to show up, right? So that's the kind of language we'll use. So, for example, there might be a production cessation. And since we've stopped producing things, don't bother coming into work anymore. We get such things as uh, Procter & Gamble uh, has a plan called Strengthening Global Effectiveness, which sounds terrific till you realize that it meant 13,000 workers lost their jobs. Meanwhile. General Motors was working on its lean concept of synchronous organizational structures. Guess what lean meant? But my favorite, of course, comes from Silicon Valley, where if you had called this vice president at this computer company, you would receive the recorded message that would say, you have reached the number of an uninstalled vice president. <laughs> and you certainly hope it gets restalled again. Well, workers are never laid off, just a few of the terms. They're redundant, excessed, transitioned, offered voluntary severance. Your job can be declared excess to requirements, which means that you haven't been laid off, just your job has been eliminated. By the way, since your job no longer exists, there's no need for you to come to work anymore. You can always be correct sized, which means, I guess, that you were the wrong size all along and never knew it. But now the company has taken care of that problem and made you the correct size even if you didn't want to be, and your new correct size means that you are jobless. When one firm fired 10% of all of its workers, it referred to it as a refocusing of the company's skills set. 
General Motors offered some of its employees a chance to participate in a career transition program. Those who entered the program had to leave the company once they completed the program. Interesting program to get involved with. Well, Stanford University called it repositioning. Another company called it reducing duplication or a focused reduction. Another company had a reshaping. Another one had involuntary methodologies that resulted in involuntary severance. Uh, one of the telephone companies announced the elimination of its employment security policy. <laughs> Once you've been made insecure, the next step was jobless. Then there was the bank that laid off 14,000 workers, but they didn't really do that. You see, what they did is they eliminated 14,000 jobs, which resulted in a release of resources. Not workers, resources. Then there was the Voluntary Window Incentive Program, available to 1,200 workers. Ha, ha, ha. Yeah, enter that program and see where it got you, right out the back door. Of course, Walmart store, when they laid off 1,200 workers, called it a normal payroll adjustment. I always liked correct size, or, um, because, or right sizing. My question always was, well, you mean we've had the wrong size all these years, right? Now we're getting the, the right size. Well, it seems to me we ought to can all the guys who had it wrong all those years, right? I mean, if they're just figuring it out now, why do we keep those executives who had it wrong all that time? Well, companies will implement a skills mix adjustment, a chemistry change, vocational relocation, career assignment and relocation. Then there's a realignment or rebalancing of the workforce, a consolidation of operations. Then there's a company that undertook a major repos repositioning and scaled down its workforce. It goes on, page after page after page. And of course, when AT&T in my state of New Jersey announced 40,000 workers got the ax, they didn't say that at all. These workers were simply not reassigned. Just last week, a good friend of mine called me up and uh, asked us to go out and celebrate with her because when she went into work, she found out that she had not been deselected. I said, gee, I mean, does that mean you were selected? No, she said, I just wasn't deselected. But this, these are the words that, that affect people's lives. One final note, I don't want to keep you here all, I mean, this, this stuff can go on forever. Uh, what I'll do is give you this one last section, and then I'll give you the very latest that I've picked up. I mean, one of the things you, you become aware of as you travel, even as you sit in your living room, I mean, this stuff is every place. They keep coming up with new stuff every day. I'll give you some of the new stuff. Now, some background on this section. If you remember the novel 1984 and what happens to Winston Smith, um, Winston, of course, is given what we would call today re-education. I mean, he has to be taught to love Big Brother. He has to be taught that the world that he perceives and experiences isn't the real world. It's only the world that the party teaches him to experience it. And of course, the, ult the, the climax of the novel is when Winston Smith um, sits in the cafe and traces two plus two equals five. And he believes it. He believes it because this is what he's been taught to believe. You think that's fiction? I lived in uh, China for a while, and I taught in China. I made a lot of friends. After Tiananmen Square, I've never heard from my friends. I, I really don't know what happened to them. Uh, I hope they're all right and just not writing. I don't know. But Tiananmen Square, I was very interested in. So let me begin with a brief quote from 1984, the novel. Reality is not external. Reality exists in the human mind and nowhere else not in the individual mind, which can make mistakes, and in any case soon perishes, only in the mind of the party, which is collective and immortal. Whatever the party holds to be truth is truth. It is impossible to see reality except by looking through the eyes of the party. I wrote this essay on uh, Tiananmen Square. Thousands of troops did not attack the students in Tiananmen Square on June 4, 1989. No students were shot, bayoneted, or crushed by tanks. No one died in Tiananmen Square. No, no one died in Tiananmen Square. No one died in Tiananmen Square. What really happened was the triumph of restraint and sacrifice by the brave troops who, as they approached the square, were viciously attacked by savage gangs of counter-revolutionary rioters, armed finance, and directed by overseas reactionary political forces. 
Despite all their attempts to subdue the, the rioters, the troops were forced to open fire. For as General Li Jiun said, the fact is the army was forced to use violence to enter the city. But even then, it never happened that soldiers fired directly at the people. Indeed, as the general so clearly pointed out, there was no such thing as bloodshed on Tiananmen Square. It is not from any instance from the soldiers directing their guns at the people. This incident never happened within the area of Beijing. Yes, it is true, the general also said. If we didn't use military force, we couldn't have cleared the square. But then, it never happened. No one died in Tiananmen Square. The testimony of your own eyes cannot and should not be believed. The existence, the extensive videotaped scenes of the violence and death in Tiananmen Square simply misled you from the truth. After all, as Jian Mu, the spokesperson for the government, made so clear, the development of modern technology can allow people to turn out even a longer film to distort the truth of the matter. No one died in Tiananmen Square. Nor can you believe rumor-mongering eyewitnesses such as Zhao Bin, who claimed tanks and armored personnel carriers rolled over students, squashing them into jam. The soldiers shot at them and hit them with clubs. When students fainted, the troops killed them. After they died, the troops fired one more bullet into them. They also used bayonets. But those who know better reported this spreader of lies to the authorities. After the police had talked with Zhao Bin, he confessed his lies on television. I never saw anything. I apologize for bringing great harm to the party and the country. He also admitted he was a counter-revolutionary. No one died in Tiananmen Square. So too did Comrade Cho admit his error. The blood on his shirt was not that of people killed during the army's attack on the square. I was wrong, Cho said. The party and the government have said nobody was killed and I made a mistake. I was influenced by bad elements and counter-revolutionaries. The blood on my shirt was surely that of a martyred soldier. No one died in Tiananmen Square. Better to believe the four young men who testified, we were at the northeast corner of the Great Hall of the People on the fourth floor. We had a clear view of the square and saw what happened. The army did not kill anyone or hurt anyone. It is not true that any students or common people were killed in Tiananmen Square. No one died in Tiananmen Square to guide you in correct thinking, and to ensure that you truly understand what really happened, the party provides the necessary guidance. Without the Communist Party, there would be no new China. Love the party, love the socialist motherland. As the loyal party member said, what they really want is for you to say, we love Deng, we love the party, and we love socialism. And we all say it, of course. No one died in Tiananmen Square. Almost unconsciously, Winston traced with his finger in the dust on the table, two plus two equals five. It was all right. Everything was all right. The struggle was finished. He had won the victory over himself. He loved Big Brother. No one died in Tiananmen Square. One, one final note on that. I'm sure you're familiar with the famous photograph that came out of that of the lone student standing in front of the line of tanks, uh, and the whole line of tanks stopping. The tank would move. He would stand in front of it. Um, and it became a powerful picture for us. Um, many people said it shows the power of the lone individual to stand up against the power of the totalitarian state. Well, let me add two footnotes to that photograph. First, that student was later shot. Second. That poster is now a government propaganda poster in China. And the government puts it out as proof that no one died in Tiananmen Square because they say, look at this. All these tanks stopped rather than harm one person. Is this not proof that no one died in Tiananmen Square? So um, in my book, I give you a, a, a quiz. Actually, the quiz is just to have a lot of fun so you can understand some of the crazy stuff that goes on. But uh, Everything, every example is real. It, it, it's not made up. I don't make any of this stuff up. Other people write this stuff for me. It's wonderful. 
but I do very carefully document it. And it's all documented in there. If you want to read the footnotes in the back, you can track it all down, and I'll give you the sources. So when you read some of this outlandish stuff, and, and you say, they, they, they can't be serious. Well, they are. You're not a drunk or an alcoholic. You're a victim of a, detri of a habitually detrimental lifestyle. Uh, a politician who lies and gets caught has a, um, has, simply has a uh, political credibility problem. Did you watch the Olympics? Well, NBC had a problem with the Olympics. Uh, you know, they shelled out all that money and they had to get big audiences. And they had a problem because the, the sexiest events were, were during the day. And so they wanted to tape them and show them at night. But you're not going to show a videotape of an event that's already over because people might not watch it. After all, you know who won, right? Where's the suspense? So they didn't show videotaped highlights. They had plausible live time. That was their official term for showing that. Um, you don't lie. You uh, suffer from a fictitious disorder syndrome. You're not a criminal. You, uh, you have um, dysfunctional behavior. You're not crazy. It's mental activity at the margins. Um, it's not a retirement home for the elderly. It's a uh, senior congregate living uh, community for the chronologically gifted. But um, this one I discovered um, buried in The Economist, and it's one, a, a very dry article on uh, the latest results on the leading causes of death of adults in the United States. I mean, hey, is this sexy or what? It's for the year 1994 from the Center for Health Statistics. Uh, and uh, I glanced at the list to see what I'm going to die from and found something very interesting on the sixth leading cause of death, which is listed as homicide, and legal intervention. Guesses? What is legal intervention? What? Police yeah, the cop shoots you when you're running away and capital punishment. So don't think of it as capital punishment. Don't think of executing somebody. Hey, it's just legal intervention. That's all. Um, here's one from Japan. That was, that was a lot of fun. The, the Japanese right now are going through the annual reports of all their corporations, which is a big deal in Japan. And a corporation in Japan can legally, and they do, have this category of expenses in their, in their accounting reports. And, this, and the expense is called unac unaccountable expenditures. Any guesses? Right. Bribes, political payoffs, political donations, and uh, extortion payments to gangsters. That's all you have to do is put it under that category and everything is okay. So, the, the, the double speak is all over the place. And what I'm trying to point out is that it affects your life. When the doctor in Philadelphia in a hospital during a routine examination pierced, pierced the colon of the patient, killed the guy, peritonitis. It was recorded as a diagnostic misadventure of a high magnitude. Um, what happened, of course, is the family didn't know that it was malpractice and didn't know they had the basis for a lawsuit. So the language worked, did exactly what it was supposed to do, cover up the uh, therapeutic misadventure. Another term, by the way, for medical malpractice. So this language is designed to get away with something, usually at your expense. You're going to pay for this one some way or the other, in dollars, in health, or whatever. So what I try to do in the book is three things. One, in the first part, show you how the language works. So you, you, you can become better at analyzing and spotting it and see how it really works. Two, I tried to show that it's substantive and important. It's used in Supreme Court decisions. It's used in law. It's used in so many things that affect our lives. And then three, how to fight back. Because the whole point of this is you've got to fight back, and you can fight back. Uh, and I give you a whole bunch of ways to fight back, and I want you to fight back. I think you're obligated to. I think it's your moral responsibility as a citizen in a democracy. Uh, it's sort of what um, uh, Hemingway said. He, said uh, he was asked in an interview once, what does it take to become a first-rate novelist? And he said, well, you have to become a first-rate uh, bullshit detector. I think to be a citizen in a democracy, particularly today, you have to be a first-rate bullshit detector. That's the first thing. But then you've got to fight back. You've got to send it back. You have to send them a message. And I give you some suggestions that way. The problem with all this stuff is that there's so much that you feel like you're drowning in it. Uh, you you, you want to give up. 
But you won't if you maintain your sense of humor. You have to laugh at all times. And I think the best comedian in the United States today, forget Seinfeld. This guy puts them all to shame. Alan Greenspan. <laughs> and look at the money he makes for it. Best stand-up routine I've seen. My fantasy is that someday Greenspan's going before a congressional committee and he's going to give some of his testimony and this whole committee and the entire room is just going to break up in wild laughter and then they're going to say, okay, Al, okay, good routine. Now let's get serious and talk some, uh, some, some, some real language here about the economy. Here, let me give you one. This is what passes for linguistic wisdom. Now, stop for a second. By using this language, you can become the single most important person in the current presidential race. Chairman of the Federal Reserve Board. Forget the presidential candidates. The person who's going to decide who wins this one is Al Greenspan and whether he raises interest rates or not. Isn't that a scary thought? But um, I have a game. I have a copy of his most recent testimony, a transcript. I usually play a game where I randomly open it and just you know, point to anything and read the sentence. They're all the same meaningless. But here's one that you might like. This is, now think of this. You're sitting before a United States Senate committee and you're going to tell them something about the economy and everybody's sitting there listening to you. And I think where the confusion arises is the fact that you cannot view monetary policy as a sort of simple issue. If the most probable outcome is coming out of this soft patch into moderate growth with low inflation, which I think is the most probable outcome, that is not the same statement as saying that you therefore in the process of implementing monetary policy or formulating it, I should say, completely disregard what the upsides and downsides of a potential outcome may be. You know, I, I read that and I say, this guy gets paid for doing this. I'm in the wrong racket here. Uh, his salary is a lot bigger than mine. And not only that, he's respected. This is considered smart. Well, let's not talk about what might be considered dumb. That's too scary. But this, is, this language passes for economic wisdom. This is the basis on which we make econ economic policy in this country. Doesn't that scare the hell out of you? It certainly should. But we got to laugh at this. I, I still think Al is the greatest stand-up comedian. And I think what's great about his act is that he's laughing all the way home, knowing what he's getting away with. My favorite quote from him comes from 1988 in a burst of honesty and clarity. Uh, he recovered from that very quickly, I might add. He said before a, uh, a speech to the uh, New York Economics Club, uh, he prefaced his remarks by saying, I guess I should caution you. If anything I say this evening seems to be particularly clear, you have probably misunderstood me. <laughs> so, I, you know, I, I keep sending my application in as chairman of the Federal Reserve, but, you know, I never get a response. And, hey, I, I, um, I can do that as good as anyone else. Well. There's lots of stuff. I'll, I'll finish with one horrible example that has moved into the language and scares me. No one seems to be getting upset about ethnic cleansing anymore. Even as they keep digging up all the pits, the mass graves of hundreds and thousands of people slaughtered, men, women, and children in Bosnia, all as a result of ethnic cleansing. Mm, I think we ought to have a little bit more moral outrage at that phrase than we have right now and not become quite so deadened through doublespeak so that we just shrug our shoulders and move on. That, I think, is the worst thing we can do. Well, thank you. Now's the time to uh, answer your questions and entertain your comments. And if anybody wants answers to the quiz, you know, uh, I almost published the quiz without the answers until my publisher pointed out that I would be the person that would have to field all the phone calls and answer all the letters. So I decided not to. Your show. Comments? Yes. Yeah. What are some of the things you said that we can, we can do mm -hmm. to, to uh, cut See, down I, on this? I, um, first, as an individual, I think that this is why God made fax machines. Because you have to respond. Now, every politician, every public figure these days, corporations, everybody has a fax number, which is published. They have email addresses. They have websites. They have all of this. You know, talk to us, they like to say. You can go to the reference department in this bookstore and you can get, you know, uh, entire phone directories of all these people's uh, num names and numbers. Uh, 
One of the scariest things, the most cynical things I heard a couple weeks ago was a politician who said, hey, if I go on television and I say something, 60, 70, 80, 90 million people hear it. The next day, if somebody corrects it, how many people hear it? 2,000, 20,000? He shrugged. He said, you know, so who cares? Well, what if we had his fax number? What if you said, I don't care about anybody else, but I'm really mad at this one. And you just write a short fax. You call attention to this doublespeak that you're not buying it. And you send it off. So the next day, our politician walks into the office and the fax machine is gummed up because there are about 5,000 fax messages lying on the floor, all saying, hey, what are you saying? And he turns on his computer and his inbox for his uh, email has about seven, eight, nine hundred, a thousand, two thousand letters. Might give pause to that. Dial up the website. That's a very simple thing. Some of the other things that you can do as an individual, if you get these letters, hey, are you starting to get them from your local congressman telling you how beautiful and wonderful he is? Well, if you don't agree with that, why don't you annotate the letter and mail it back? In other words, I'm, in, I'm encouraging you to respond back. You can't be passive. Communication is not a one-way street. It's two ways. You listen and respond. You react. And by the way, if someone pulls this dodge on you, well, I'm sorry, but you don't understand what I'm saying, you can say, that's true, because you are too stupid to make it clear, which is your responsibility. It's not my job to try and figure out what you're saying. It's your job to make it clear so I understand. Always remember that. Don't believe that you're dumb. You're not. That's the oldest device in the world to shift it back on you. So those are a few, uh, uh, a few simple things. There's other things you can do. Um, maybe you could post it on the bulletin board. This is the age of desktop publishing. Why not start collecting examples of doublespeak, name the people, print it up, hand out a few dozen copies, ask your friends to join in, and do the same thing. On a societal level, one of the most important things we have to do is more with education. We woefully underprepare students to, to, to uh, meet the world that they're going out to. And I mean, we start at the first grade. Scariest thing that you can read is that by the time kids are in the sixth grade, only 14% of them believe that there is any truth in an ad. Second scary item, they think all television is the same as advertising. They don't see any difference between the ads, the news, or anything else. We are raising people who are extremely cynical and distrustful. We better get in there and start educating them on how they can really exercise their critical faculties to analyze language so that they don't become totally cynical. I don't know if any of you saw two weeks ago the results of a poll. Republican and Democratic parties commissioned polls on 18 to 25 year olds and their political beliefs and they were shocked by the results because what they found out is the majority of 18 to 25 year olds are A, not interested in politics, B, not registered to vote, and C, have no intention of voting. And why? Because it doesn't make any difference. They say whatever they want to say and then they do whatever they want to do, so why should I bother to vote? The cynicism is rampant. Why each presidential election do we have still fewer people participating? For the same reason, the cynicism. In other words, this language that we use, this doublespeak, is not communicating to us. That, that's, I think it's pretty serious. We live in a democracy. We need an informed electorate. We do not have a public dialogue conducted in a language in which we feel as if we're talking to each other. We feel that we're talking at each other. And look at the cynicism setting in already on the presidential campaign. Okay, for those of you who, who remember the great Criswell, who predicted. Well, Criswell is going to predict. What words are you going to see in the coming election campaign? Values. Whether they're basic values, whether they're family values. A word that is as meaningless as anything. We can put 10 people in a room, ask them to define values, and we'll come up with at least 12 different definitions. Compassion, big word compassion. Government, big word government. Notice, all these words are abstract. They seem to say something, but they say nothing. They commit the politician to nothing. Well, I did my own little study. I went back through, if you believe in public opinion polls, 
And here's what I found out that over the past six to nine months, that various polls conducted by the Wall Street Journal, the CBS, you know, various people, and these are the polls that get buried in the papers and nobody really pays too much attention to. What are people concerned with as we move into this presidential election? Well, here are some of the things that people said are really bothering them that they think should be talked about in this election. 40 million Americans without health care coverage. The growing gap between the rich and the poor. The large number of unemployed and underemployed. The continuing decline in wages. The savings and loan bailout that cost the country a half a trillion dollars and for whom no one is responsible. Campaign finance reform. But then again, as Mark Twain says, one thing about politics, you get the best Congress money can buy. What about Social Security? Is it in trouble or isn't it? What about corporate subsidies? Cato Institute estimates that it's somewhere around $380 billion a year in corporate welfare that they call for uh, reduction. The Cato Institute, by the way, in case you don't know them, is a, uh, would be labeled by, by some people as a very far-right think tank. What about defense spending? The fact that we have a current federal budget that in real dollars is greater than the defense budget at the height of the Vietnam War. What about the low rate of corporate taxes that keep declining every year? And what about what Eric Fromm called super capitalism? That is, huge corporations who feel no loyalty either to their employees or to America. And the list goes on. Well, if you look at the list of what's coming out of the uh, two leading presidential candidates, here are some of the things that I've collected from them that they're talking about. They're ta both talking about compassion. Uh, Republican candidate talks about character, e.g. Whitewater, as opposed to the Democratic candidate who talks about uh, age. Well, I'm not going to talk about the age of my, of my uh, opponent. Okay, so we're talking about age. Uh, the Democrats worry about corporate greed, the Republicans about union bosses. Uh, both are concerned about family values, whatever those might be. Both are concerned about basic values, whatever those might be. Um, both are claiming credit for welfare reform, which is a real interesting definition of the word reform. The Republicans are concerned about government being too intrusive. The Democrats are concerned about a different kind of government. You have there a list that says absolutely nothing and certainly doesn't address the concerns. I point out in my book that uh, people tend to judge things according to their everyday life. Uh, my friends, and I do too, um, worry about paying the bills, making enough money to keep up with, uh, with rising expenses. I do the grocery shopping in my family. I can tell you all about food expenses. I know how much it costs. I track them. I know how much my property taxes go up each year. I know all of that. That's what I'm concerned about. I'm concerned about the fact that, you know, uh, like most people, I haven't seen a wage increase in a long time. That's what I think um, we, we look at for a public dialogue and discussion. And instead, we get the language that I describe here as abstract, that seems to say something and says nothing, that seems to promise everything and promise nothing. But most importantly, it is the language of non-accountability. Hey, if you elect me president and I'm going to do something about basic family values, what do I have to do when I get elected? Absolutely nothing. I'm committed to nothing. And what I'll do is I'll hire a couple really good spin doctors, which is the term we give to people who professionally create doublespeak, to convince you that I'm a terrific guy and the best president you've ever had in a long time. Uh, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm looking forward to the debates because my favorite part of any kind of, uh, of political speech or debate is the follow-up. This is where the spin doctors come on to tell me what I have just heard. I mean, what? Am I hard of hearing here that I missed something? These guys get paid to do this. They're going to stop and think about that for a second. Are you outraged? Aren't you upset? I mean, it's bad enough you had to listen to this political speech that said absolutely nothing, but now they're going to come on and tell you even more nothing, that this is what you heard, and you didn't hear this. Well, you know, maybe I taped it on my VCR, and that's what I found. I, I guess I'm fighting against cynicism. And, and, the, and cynicism that leads into a withdrawal and a passivity. And I would like to see people um, get a little more involved. And I would like to think that, that my book is a, is a handbook for agitation, um, a call to arms about language. 
because the language belongs to you and me and everyone else. And they're stealing it from us. They're taking it away from us. They're taking it away from us and beating us over the head with it. And I'd like to take the club back, beat them over the head with it. And I think you only do that if each and every one of you do that. Besides that, you can have a hell of a lot of fun doing it. And it's really funny. Laugh. You ever, I mean, did you ever see how pompous and serious these people are? People ought to laugh more. We ought to laugh at Alan Greenspan. We ought to laugh at some of these absurd, ridiculous statements that, that are said to us. It's an insult to our intelligence. It's so insulting that you, at times you can't get mad. All you can do is laugh. Laugh a lot. Just laugh. You know the old game where a group of you got together and you didn't let one person in on it. And every time you all looked at that person, you just laughed. And when the person said, what's wrong, you all said, nothing. And then you'd look at it and laugh. Wouldn't that be great to do? Let's just pick one politician and do that. Wouldn't we make them paranoid? Wouldn't that be fun? Wouldn't it be great to turn it back on them for a change and not feel so powerless? You are not powerless. You've got the same weapon, the same tools that every politician has. You've got the English language. Use it. Use it. You can. Use it. Use it as a club. Use it to pound them in some sense into their heads and some accountability out the other end. Um, any other questions or do you want more outrageous examples? Yeah? Does it seem uh, that uh, double speak is a lot more prevalent in the English language? Is it something peculiar to the English language or it's going to exist in uh, just about any language? It exists in all languages. Double speak is inherent in any language because you can use any language this way. Uh, when I edited the quarterly re review of double speak, I got examples from all over the world. I mean, you name the country. I got the examples. Um, you know, we have the Japanese examples. A lot of great stuff in Japan, let me tell you. Really wonderful stuff. But you get it from every culture, every society, from France. doesn't make any difference. In fact, The Economist recently ran an article on the doublespeak, uh, current doublespeak used by the French government. So it's, it's all over the place. Yes? Yeah, this is about class action lawsuits and the phrase, all, all others similarly situated. Now, if William Lutz had a, a 1995 Ford, let's say, and had a spare tire, or didn't receive a spare, true spare tire, but one of those temporary spare tires, and filed suit to get a spare tire. Everyone else in this audience could join in if we also had a 1995 Ford. Wouldn't matter if we were male or female, black or white, or our social or economic background, we would be all similarly situated. We have a situation in Illinois where um, the state was sued by the ACLU on behalf of abused and elected children, and the ACLU filed suit on behalf of mental patients in a separate lawsuit. And they claimed they were all similarly situated. Well, that issue was never litigated in the lawsuit. They just agreed to it. So they went ahead and settled the lawsuit and uh, promised new, quote, new protections, new reforms. Yet, since that time, children died. And they didn't die because of leukemia or a plane crash. They died because they were abused and neglected with the issue of the lawsuit. I mean, the, uh, uh, the parent killed the child. Now we have a case, and this is where doublespeak comes in, we have a live child and a dead child, and the government is claiming that they're similarly situated, and they aren't. And it presents a conflict of interest for them, and, and they haven't resolved it. Yeah, isn't law wonderful? Uh, by the way, full disclosure time, I'm also a lawyer. Uh, I'm not a practicing lawyer. I am a member of the Pennsylvania Bar, but I am a lawyer. And actually, one of the things I do is I, I do an awful lot of work of trying to promote plain language in the law. But uh, what you have hit is, is called the legal term of art, similarly situated. And actually, when lawyers do that, you know why they do that? Because the courts require them to do that. You have to do that in a, in a class action suit. You have to say similarly situated. And isn't it wonderful that in the law, a dead child and a live child are the same? That's Scary really stuff. Not. No, of course they're not. I mean, well, no, hey. <laughs> I can do a lot of things in law, and if you read the chapter in law where things are really bizarre, hey, how about Justice William Rehnquist on the Supreme Court in, in a landmark case that denied women pregnancy benefits under health care? Now, how did he get around the problem that equal protection in the Constitution says that everybody has to be treated the same? Simple. He said, what we're dealing with here are pregnant women and non pregnant persons. Okay, guys, this is logic 101 time. Do we all remember the rules of classification? That you must classify everything on the one basis at a time. Now, are women and persons the same basis of classification? No. No, they're not. I mean, you got to say, 
If you're going to say non-pregnant women, then the other part of the class is pregnant women. If you're going to say uh, pregnant women and non-pregnant persons, no, no, then you got to do two persons or two women. In other words, he just deliberately used the language to avoid the decision. Women is plural. Well, that's what he did, women, but he, then he said non-pregnant persons. By the way, the same decision upheld the right for men to have elective um, uh, surgery for uh, boldness. But women were legally disallowed from pregnancy benefits. Oh, by the way, in passing, Justice Rehnquist noted that pregnancy is voluntary. Could you expand on this uh, uh, live child and dead child? Oh, wait, wait, you mean that they're the same? Um, it, well, let me give you another example that, and the way it would work. Um, if you were to file a lawsuit, you were suing somebody over something because uh, maybe somebody did something that broke your leg uh, and you filed a lawsuit. And of course, since um, you know, courts move with blazing speed, it's now five years later and um, you unfortunately have died of a heart attack. Got news for you. The lawsuit keeps going because the court will treat, the, the court doesn't worry that you're dead. It goes to my estate. Yes. And uh, then those who are in line for my estate get the money, right? Right. Same thing here. The live child and the dead child, it's the same thing. The court is concerned with addressing the issue. That, that's all it's concerned with. Yeah, well, remember the great scene. If you've, if you've ever seen the movie um, on... Uh, if you've seen The Paper Chase, um, the great movie on law school, where uh, John Hausman says in that, that famous line, oft quoted, by the way, by law students, he looks at this class of first-year law students, he said, you come in here with a mind like mush, and when you leave here, we'll teach you to think like lawyers. Well, for those of you who've gone to law school, you know they're right. Um, actually, when you're in law school, you'll find that your only friends are other law students because normal human beings can't stand to have you around. Okay, one more. Um, I, I, th I saw another hand. Now is the time to uh, to raise a hand. I about the, the power of the press. Oh, At one good time, question. the press was supposed to be like sort of the watchdog for that kind of bullshit. Um, You're right. Now it seems that they sort of perpetrate that that same thing that they were supposedly supposed to watchdog. I was wondering if you could comment on yes, that. Yes, in fact, I, this is a continuing dialogue I have with many reporters, and here's their answer. I'll give it to you as best I can, and I think I'm being fair in this representation. They say, look. Uh, our job is to is to report the news. If a politician uses this phrase, I mean, we can't editorialize on it. We'll we'll give it back to you. Now, we may editorialize on ed in editorials or in a commentary piece or a column or something. Well, to which I respond, all well and good, except when you pick up a newspaper and there's a foreign word or phrase or there's a technical term, don't they explain it for you? They don't assume that you know something. They'll explain it. I said, if you run into doublespeak, why don't you explain it for us? You know better than your audience, and you would only be helping them understand what this language means. My best example of that is the phrase revenue enhancement. Uh, that phrase I once documented was deliberately created. They had a committee meeting in the White House, by the way. Everybody came up with a term for tax increase, then they voted on it. Revenue enhancement won. Now, revenue enhancement died a, a, a quick death when newspaper reporters started to write in their columns, revenue enhancement, comma, the administration's term for tax increase, comma. That's all they had to do. And of course, they went on to receipt strengthening, and then it became user fees, and then the Clinton administration came up with wage-based premium. But hey, at least we <laughs> killed one, right? But you got to keep after them. They'll keep, they'll keep producing it. But you're right. The, I think the press does have a responsibility at least to point it out, because the reporters know it better than we. Because there is language here that we have absolutely no idea what it means. And they do, and they should report it. By the way, anybody know um, what it means to uh, the term um, males with female features? Male with female features? Yes. Is that what you said? Males with female features. Or you can do it singular, male with female features. Official term, usually by the U.S. Army. During the Persian Gulf War, the government of Saudi Arabia, not exactly noted for, its, uh, for championing uh, uh, women's rights, objected to the fact that uh, large numbers of those foreign troops coming in were women in positions of authority and responsibility, something which they did not want in their society. But the U.S. Army replied that we cannot function without women. They are an integral part of our military. 
So the compromise was reached, and all official documents, including passports, women were called males with female features. <laughs> and everybody was happy. You see what you can do with this stuff? Isn't it great? Yes. Uh, when is there a time when it started? When does double speak started, or has it always been with us? Is it's it in recorded, the Bible? Uh, it, it, yeah, it's recorded history. Take a look at the Bible. What did Cain say? Hey, am I my brother keeper? Uh, Julius Caesar didn't uh, conquer Gaul; he pacified Gaul. The Romans didn't execute anybody. Uh, they treated him in the ancestral manner. Tacitus writes of the conquest of uh, Britain by quoting Calgacus, one of the. Uh, uh, British chieftains who was defeated by the Romans when he said they have made a wasteland and called it peace. It's always there. It's been there throughout history because the great tool of power is language. Mao Te Tsung was wrong. Power doesn't grow out of the barrel of a gun. Particularly in this day and age, it is the control of language. That's what George Orwell was writing about in 1984. Control the language. Hell, you don't need thought police. Just control the language. Let me give you a current example. In the last Congress, in the debate over Medicare, the Democrats won because they won the debate of getting the word cut adopted to describe the proposal. The Republicans lost. They used the words, we're trying to reform Medicare to save it. The fight was between how we were going to define it in those terms. Democrats won. Their word won. They won the debate. They won the issue. They'll fight that one out again this time around. We're fighting over words. Yeah, uh, language evolves constantly. It may be being abused at one end of the spectrum. Do you see a place in America where non-duplicitous language is originating? I mean, is there a new um, language maybe by the kids, maybe by a certain sector of the economy, maybe the computer industry that's producing non-duplicitous language? Or is there a place where it's coming out raw and new, um, as opposed to just being abused on the after it's been around for yeah, a while? Yeah, because we don't have the public speakers we used to have. I mean, the decline of public oratory in, this, in the United States the past 20 years is pretty sad to behold. Internet has a lot of great stuff. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a lot of free swing and free wheeling uh, debate on the Internet. Hey, try and engage a little BS on the Internet, and boy, 14 people jump all over you, <laughs> trample you right into the dust. I mean, that, that's a vigorous uh, debate and discussion. And I, and I think that, um, you know, principle of unintended consequences. Nobody can predict what's going to happen, but uh, I, I think a lot of the debate and dialogue in the Internet, I'm hoping, will bubble over into public debate and dialogue. Yeah, because it seems rather independent, and anybody's opinion is just as good as someone else who can type anywhere, so it's, it's not, like, institutionalized yet, so everybody's point comes across Yeah, and it, it's very democratic because it, you don't stand up and have, a, you know, I'm standing up in front of you, so I gain a certain authority to speak. Uh, you don't have anonymous that on the internet. Too, if you want it to be. Pardon? It's anonymous too. If you want it yes. to be, and so therefore you can pretty much say what you want. You can be anything you want. Yeah. Um, and and I'm, it's going to be interesting to track that to see if that kind of vigorous uh, use of language will spill over into public dialogue, or at least make us want to hear the same kind of language used in, in, in public debate and discussion, particularly in politics. Don't know. We'll just have to ride that one. But I, I hope it doesn't become an outlet. That is an alternative. I hope it becomes a springboard to demanding more. But if I look around and do I see good stuff? I try to find it actually. I try to find good lines and they're few and far between. There's not that much to track. Thank you, I guess we're done. And now I sign, if you want, if you want me to sign the book, glad to. I mean, you don't, you're not obligated. <laughs>